podcasting from sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to Tips for Tour Operators, your podcast for growth hacks, marketing tips, and actionable insights from leading experts in the tourism industry. Welcome Tour Operators. I'm Adam Arkfeld, owner of Outdoor Adventure Marketing and your host for the Tips for Tour Operators podcast. Today, we're going to be talking with Ingrid Edstrom, who is the CEO of Polymath, a bookkeeping and accounting firm just for tour operators. Ingrid was listed as one of the accounting profession's top 40 under 40 professionals and also one of the most powerful women in accounting. Today, we're going to be talking about how to make your tour more profitable, as well as what processes and systems you'll need while you're on that journey. So let's get started. Uh, Here's our interview with Ingrid Edstrom. Ingrid, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Today we have Ingrid Edstrom with Polymath, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about bookkeeping and profitability. So Ingrid, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about your background and how you got into the tour industry and about your business. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Adam. This is really fun. Um, So we have a little accounting practice in Southern Oregon called Polymath, and we specialize in tour companies. Um, Our bookkeeping practice, we do management accounting, so we don't do tax accounting. That's a different little world. There are lots of different kinds of accountants. Management accountants and bookkeepers focus on helping business owners make educated decisions on a day-to-day basis. So we use QuickBooks Online and other software applications to make it easier for businesses to pull together the information that they need so that they can make the decisions that will help their company prosper and really look forward driving their business via the windshield rather than the rear view mirror, strategizing and planning so that they can have a profitable tour season. Great. And tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in tours. You know, we kind of stumbled into it. We had a client that came to us that is actually local here in Southern Oregon, but they operate tours in Mexico. And as we were looking through our client list and really trying to figure out what area we wanted to specialize in, which clients did we want to replicate, it was sort of a no brainer. We were looking at this fantastic client we had and we're like, let's clone this one. You know, we really enjoy working with clients who love what they do, really, really love their businesses and aren't afraid of technology. So they're, you know, fine with bringing on new applications if it's going to make their lives easier. They are eager to learn and they're doing something to bring people together, to really bridge gaps in communication and cross borders and make the world a better place. And I think the tour industry is one of the main industries that do that. And so we share that common passion. And because there's that common passion for what we're doing, we're able to build something amazing together. And that's what we really love doing is helping people feel their dreams, follow their passion and spread that passion to others. Yeah, that's great. That's actually a a somewhat similar story to ours, uh, having a couple of clients that did tours and then uh, that, that passion is really infectious and it's a fun industry to be in. Oh, absolutely. So you cover a lot of areas um, as a as an accountant and providing accounting services. And the one that we had talked about was profitability. Mm-hmm. And so why don't uh, tell me a little bit about some of the problems that you see when you're working with tour operators in terms of their profitability and the issues that they experience? Well, generally, when we first start working with a tour company, one of the main reasons why they come to us is because they're running out of money and they don't even know why. And that's one of the big major red flags that's really easy to see is if your bank account is running dry, particularly in the off season, it means that your company is not actually profitable. If you're having to plow back your earnings as the owner Mm -hmm. into the company to make it so that you've got fuel for the next year, then the company is struggling. And that's something that we can help with. And, you know, we're a small company. We can't help every tour company in the world, which is why we've got some tools for tour companies if they want to look into doing it themselves. We love doing education. So there's some articles that we've written about profitability and budgeting that you can look into on our website. The main thing is that it's really important to make sure that that cash is lasting you. And if it's not, it's not that the company is failing and dying. It's that there needs to be a few more intentional choices made and they need to be made in the moment. And the only way to do that is to actually be looking at this data in the moment. So that means you need to be collecting the data and using it. And it can be challenging at first, but it gets easier with practice. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned plowing back money back into the business. 
<laughs> what are some of the, the pain points that might identify profitability issues or that you see people struggling with on the profitability side? Well, I mean, the biggest pain point is running out of money. Um, but the other thing is not having the owners not pay themselves enough. It's one of the, the really sad things in business is, you know, we, we get these ideas in our head that we have to spend money to make money and that it's better to give than to receive. And as a result, we end up with these situations where we've got this generation of small business owners that are murdering themselves mm -hmm. on behalf of their businesses. It's a very common poverty mindset. I don't, have you read the book, The Go-Giver by Bob Berg and John David Mann? I have not. You might really enjoy that book. They talk about the five laws of stratospheric success. And the fifth of these laws, I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version and skip to the end. The fifth law is the law of receptivity. And the law of receptivity is a little different than the law of reciprocity. We all know the law of reciprocity. What goes around comes around. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We want to help each other. It's the golden rule. But the law of receptivity is a little different. The law of receptivity states that in order to effectively and truly give of ourselves, we first must be open to receiving. And that's one of the big tricky things that a lot of people, um, particularly business owners, fail to quite understand is that we're blocking our own flow. Money is not this evil thing. You know, a lot of people see money as the tool of the man. Well, if you're constantly pushing it away, is it any wonder you don't have any? Yeah. <laughs> Money's not good or bad. It's not evil. It's whatever we choose to use it for. And it is the flow of abundance in our lives. It's how we bring in the things that we want to need. It's how we manifest our reality. And so we need to make friends with our money. And part of it is we need to be open to receiving that. And we have a bad habit in the small business world of thinking that we don't deserve <laughs> to get paid for the great work that we're doing and the amazing things that we're creating. And we develop allergies to the ideas of selling and closing the sale and marketing because we're afraid to ask when it doesn't even have to be about asking, it can be about offering. It can be about offering opportunities that people are happy to pay for. And it's all about perceived value and welcoming this kind of financial abundance into our lives. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of coaching through these limiting beliefs that we were brought up with. We learned these things from our parents as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. So if we can get past that block to receiving and open ourselves up to the abundance that's coming our way and recognize that part of budgeting for a healthy business is also budgeting to make sure that you're getting paid enough to have your business sustain your lifestyle. Your business isn't healthy if your personal finances aren't healthy. Our business problems are our personal problems in disguise. So we need to look at the whole picture. It's kind of holistic accounting and make sure that there's financial health in the mix. And in order to get financially healthy, it's the same as getting your body healthy. It takes having a good diet. It takes exercise. And those things take discipline. And it really, really helps to have an accountability ally who can help you with that discipline. So working with a bookkeeper or a management accountant is a lot like having a personal trainer for your business. And it is much more effective than trying to learn how to do it yourself because if you go to the gym and you don't know how, what you're doing, you might hurt yourself on some of those machines. Mm -hmm. They're a little scary. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in the same way, you know, if we are, if I'm traveling, if I'm going to a foreign country and I don't speak the language, I want to make sure that I'm on a tour with a guide that knows the terrain. Most small business owners don't know the terrain of accounting and it's really, really helpful to have a guide. So those are some of the main areas to look at. And it really comes down to our core beliefs around money and finance. It's not just the systems and processes. There's some good internal stuff going on here that we need to look at. And it helps to reflect with somebody and get the judgments set aside because usually those judgments are self-judgments. Yeah. And, and there's sometimes guilt associated with success and making more money and absolutely right. feeling like maybe you're taking too much and... You know, there's all these external variables with employees yeah. and people saying prices are too high or too low, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of dynamics that run through that yeah. for a business owner. 
Well, and what's too much? You know, that's one of the tricky things is that too much is based on comparison mm -hmm. and comparison to whom? Mm -hmm. In our day of social media, what we're seeing of people's lives is the highlight reel. And we're catching glimpses of their success and comparing our insides to other people's outsides. And it's not effective. So we need to get rid of the comparison game and recognize that there's a lot behind the curtain that we're not seeing. And also recognize that the number one fear of every entrepreneur is the fear of being called as a fake. Having somebody say, how dare you say that you're an entrepreneur when you don't know everything there is to know about running a small business. Nobody does. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so with the tour company, you know plenty about the place that you're going and the people there and the best destinations and how to make sure that people don't get sick. I mean, that's important. I went to Mexico and got Montezuma's revenge from eating the wrong food or drinking the wrong something. It wasn't fun. If I had a guide with me to say, yeah, don't eat that. <laughs> I could have avoided that couple days of extreme stomach upset. So it's these kinds of pitfalls that we can help each other with and recognizing that most small business owners don't know the major pitfalls of the financial side of running a small business and that it's okay to ask for help, that there's no failing in that whatsoever. And that there are people who can help you get through that. And there are educational resources online. If you don't want to work directly with somebody, you can watch some of the videos or blogs that are out there. And you know, that's, that's the big idea is that we want to create a rising tide that raises all ships, that there's, there's no limit to the possibilities of what we can do if we work together. So if someone's driving right now and they're, they're just listening to this in their car, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're, they probably have a couple of thoughts going through their minds related to their financial health. What's, uh, what's the easiest way to determine if, they, if someone has good financial health or are profitable? Um, you know, just kind of like a gut check, you know, what, what are some indicators that they may um, want to consider getting some help or that they, mm -hmm. they feel good about where they are right now? So generally, if you're in good financial health and you're profitable, you know it. Because in the same way that um, if somebody is in good physical health and they feel good about their body, they don't have that niggling thing in the back of their head that's like, you know, telling them they're fat or something like that, you know? They, they are proud of their workout regimen. They're proud of the food that they eat. And they recognize that, yeah, Sometimes we're going to give ourselves treat, er, treats, everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, but generally they know if they're in good financial health because they take pride in it. If someone's not feeling that pride in where they are in their business or they're not sure, then they could probably use a little bit of help. They could probably use a little bit of direction and they may be better off than they think they are or they could be much worse than they think they are. I mean, there's some people out there who take great pride in their health and then they drop dead of a heart attack while they're on a job. Mm -hmm. There's always potential things, pitfalls that you know are unexpected. I mean, there can be disruptions in tours based on weather or um, political unrest that can cause issues that were unexpected. And there are things that you can do to plan ahead for some of those issues so that a single disruption doesn't close down your great company. And you know, your company could be doing really, really well, but if you haven't planned for some of those ifs, ands, or buts, then you could be doing even better. So the main thing is we never know what we don't know, and it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. So even if you think you're doing great, then you know, maybe check in with your tax professional, your bookkeeper, and say, you know, I feel like we're doing pretty well, where could we maybe be doing even better? Could I be setting aside money for a bad year just in case? And then we know that we've got, you know, several tens of thousands of dollars set aside, you know, for a rainy day, you know, in case something happens and we need to pivot. Call it your pivot account. Setting aside funds for the just in case is really important. Yeah. So if someone is, uh, someone might be feeling, you know, uh, I don't, I don't feel confident about my finances. And if you watch, um, I don't know if you, there's, if you've seen the show, the profit where he kind of breaks down like the cost of a product, uh, based on the, the product as a price, and then he breaks down each individual component. Mm -hmm. So what are some, 
what would be a next step for a tour operator to take if they're not feeling profitable when it comes to assessing their own business um, as it relates to expenses for specific tours, mm -hmm. some tours being more profitable than others. How does someone start, you know, just on their own, you know, maybe before coming to you, how does someone start to, to look at that and, and dig into that to gain a little bit more awareness and insight? Because there's a lot of moving parts related to um, operator costs and food Absolutely and transportation right. and, you know, rent and your own salary. Yeah. You sort of look at that? So, one of the main things is make sure that you're using an accounting software, um, whether it be QuickBooks, Sage, Zero, whatever floats your boat. Um, here at Polymath, we love QuickBooks Online. That is our preferred accounting platform that we use with all of our clients. And one of the reasons why we love QuickBooks Online is because you can access it from anywhere. It's in the cloud. So when we're here in Ashland and our clients are, well, their companies are based all over the US, but of course they're running tours all over the world they can access their QuickBooks from Africa and we can access it from Oregon and we can be having a conversation online like you and I are having right now and we can keep these things rolling. And it, whereas if you're using a desktop based software application, that's not going to work very, very well for a tour company because most tour companies have disparate teams where the people who need to access that data are spread all over the globe and it's not very effective. So having a, an accounting platform, preferably in the cloud is a good place to start. And then there are other applications that can help. The first one being a booking app. Um, if you're using a booking application that can integrate in some way with QuickBooks, that's fantastic. Um, otherwise, we also have some third-party apps that can get data from some of the more popular booking applications and get it into QuickBooks so that you're not double entering all of your data. We try to eliminate redundancy in these processes. We don't want it to take too much time. Um, and then also other applications such as Expensify. Expensify is a great app for expense tracking that does integrate with QuickBooks and their tagline is expense reports that don't suck. Mm. And that's a great tool for making sure that you're able to track your expenses wherever you are, including for your team in cash in foreign currencies. So if you are, you know, out there spending gads of, you know, physical currency in Thai bot, <laughs> you can actually put those expenses into Expensify in Thai bot in real time so that you're not having to keep a wad of receipts. You can snap a picture of it with your phone, even if you're off the beaten path and don't have signal. And then it will sync when you get back to civilization. And it will put those expenses into QuickBooks mm -hmm. as of the exchange rate that day in US dollars. It's pretty cool. Wow. So there's a lot of really powerful tools out there that we can leverage. Um, another great tool that we actually created that it is really straightforward and simple. We have a budgeting template. If someone wants to budget for their tours, um, there's a blog on my website at polymath.com that talks about profitability for the tour industry. And within that blog, there's a link to our budget template. And anyone is welcome to download it for free and use that tool as a jumping board to be able to start thinking about their tour budget in advance. And that way they've got something to start that discussion and get the good processes rolling because we need to start somewhere. Yeah. So collecting that data sounds like yeah. it's really important. You did mention booking engines and there are a ton of booking engines out there. What are some of the booking engines that you're seeing are, um, are working best with integrating data into the, into QuickBooks that you're working in a lot? Um, so We've got a couple clients that use Peak, and Peak is a fun product. We, we enjoy working with the Peak team. They've got some great tools. They just launched their Zapier integration. So Zapier is another third-party app that integrates with both Peak and QuickBooks, and it can take some data, data from Peak and put it into QuickBooks. That being said, as we're talking today on February 15th, 2018, um, they just launched that integration, and as the accounting professionals um, looking at this from the outside in, there's still some kinks to work out. It's not getting quite all of the data that we need, 
Um, one of the main things that we really enjoy about using QuickBooks Online with tour companies is the feature of class tracking. And class tracking is kind of like tagging or earmarking your income and your expenses to show that it falls into different categories. And one of the ways that we use class tracking in QuickBooks is for the different tours. So you can mark which tour income and expenses associated with and then run a profit and loss report for each tour. And you can even see them side by side. It's really, really nice. And be able to see what your gross profit margin is on each tour. See what percentage your cost of goods or cost of sales in case of tour companies, your direct expenses related to the tours, what percentage that is of the income coming in. Because if you're spending more on making and creating the tour than people are actually paying you, then the tour is not profitable. Never mind the fact that you're not going to make payroll and pay yourself out of that tour at all. <laughs> you need to make sure that you're actually getting money out of it. In order to do that, you've got to be tracking it. So some of the um, booking applications haven't yet introduced class tracking that brings in the data from um, the way that we need to see it. And we have some other ways of looking at that. that there's a third party application called Transaction Pro that if we can export the data into a, a CSV and Excel file and massage the data in Excel, we can create something that can then import the data into QuickBooks manually. So it's not as automated as a Zapier that just zaps it. When, when something happens in Peak, then it happens in QuickBooks and it goes through on its own. Um, but we need to make sure that all of the data that we need is there. And we're excited to be looking at and working with Peak and offering them feedback of, hey, so did you realize you're missing this important component over here? It's so one of the interesting things that as the, the world, every industry is currently being disrupted by technology and the tour industry is no exception and the disruptions have really just started over the last handful of years with all these new booking apps coming out and the um, changes to the booking apps as they are advancing their technology to have more integrations with um, MailChimp and other newsletter engines and um, relationship software and relationships with the shopping carts. Um, you know, there's some great tools out there. And alas, most of these fantastic software applications aren't looking at their apps and workflows from an accounting standpoint, and they don't realize where there's holes in their data. <laughs> mm. So we're helping them with that. We're helping to show them you're missing this thing over here. And if you can make your app talk to QuickBooks or to other software applications, that would be fantastic. That's going to really shepherd you forward and put you on the front edge of things. Another app that's actually really great with that is Checkfront is a booking application that does have a direct QuickBooks online integration. So rather than using Zapier or Transaction Pro, it talks to QuickBooks on its own and they connect directly. Um, we haven't gotten to use them yet for a client um, personally, but we're looking forward to doing so. Checkfront from what we've seen in their demos is particularly good with tour companies that also have rentals. So say you have a paddle boat company or a bike company or something like that, um, they can help with the rental booking and have tools that are pretty solid for that. And we're looking forward to really getting in there with them because we've got a paddle boat rental company that's looking forward to implementing that transition over the next couple of months. So we can let you know how that goes. And then also um, Resgo is another app that we've done a great demo of and the reports on their back end are really inclusive. So we can get good data out of their system that can be used in Transaction Pro to import the data into QuickBooks. And the team at Resgo is just a joy to talk to. Every time I've had an encounter with them, they're just so much fun. And that's the case with most people in this industry, you know? You guys and the app partners and of course the tour companies themselves, Everyone is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it is a fun industry. So, uh, you mentioned er, um, in the beginning of that, you were starting to talk about um, class tracking and tracking different tours, and you start talking about expenses. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the areas that you've seen that tour operators consistently overspend or maybe 
don't manage those expenses as closely as they should. Yeah. Some red flags or blinders that maybe tour operators are experiencing. Absolutely. So on the direct expense side of things, so the expenses that go into creating the tour, so there's direct expenses and there's, there's indirect expenses. Indirect expe expenses are the company overhead. So things like paying your accountant or paying your electric bill, those are indirect. They have nothing to do with the tour directly. Um, as far as direct expenses go, some common pitfalls are dining. So as you're bringing um, the, the guests out, it's, it's easy to get overly hospitable if you don't have a budget in mind of how much you want to spend per person. It's easy to think, oh, you know, well, you know, this is a flush tour. We're doing great. I'm going to treat this entire group of guests to some extra drinks because it's a hot day. But if you're on a tour with 20 people and each of those drinks is three, four bucks, that adds up quickly. And that can be, you know, a big difference on your tours gross profit, whether or not you're actually making good money. If you keep doing that again and again, every day on a five day tour, it adds up really fast. The other main pitfall that I see in the direct expense side of things, especially when a tour company has employed guides that are not business owners that aren't looking at the big picture finances, oftentimes we just hand those guides a wide of cash and they almost see it as their job to go through all the money. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, they, you know, it's, it's easy for cash to burn a hole in somebody's pocket. And unfortunately, a lot of tour companies don't monitor that cash very effectively. They just get to the end of the tour and say, well, this is what is spent too late now, but they're not working with and coaching their guides through this is what we expect. And if you're overspending, there could be problems. <laughs> And having rewards and incentives and also potentially um, consequences for not working within the company's spending rules. The right. other big problem with cash that can really affect a company is fraud, embezzlement. If you're handing your guides a wad of cash, and unfortunately, trust is not an internal control. We, we trust people. We want to trust them. We want to um, have the relationships that we picture. But especially when you're working with guides that are local. Um, oftentimes there can be some, some prejudice or even racism uh, against the foreign owned tour company and embezzlement happens, you know, if they're seeing, you know, that rich American, because they don't know, they don't know what the culture is here and what the, um, the needs are. They assume that if you've got Netflix, you must be rolling in it. <laughs> and oftentimes if they're looking at some of those situations and assuming, well, if you can afford to fly from America to here, then you're rich compared to me. I deserve this more than you do. And they find ways to pilfer a bit here and there. They find ways to justify it in their minds. And there's a lot of great education out there about the fraud triangle. What elements have to be involved in order for fraud to be able to take place. And generally it's the justification in someone's mind, oh, I deserve this. <laughs> um, it's the opposite the, of what we were talking about before. Exactly, <laughs> it's that justification. It's also um, the, the need, the perceived need that they are creating. But the biggest thing that we can do on the accounting side and on the side of the business owner is simply eliminating the opportunity. And oftentimes it's just awareness. Letting your guides know, hey, we are monitoring this and we're gonna hold you accountable for the cash that we give you, plain and simple. And it doesn't have to be, oh, we're watching you like a hawk and we don't trust you. It's, this is how we do it. And we, we need to make sure that we're tracking this for the accounting purposes and it doesn't have to be an uncomfortable conversation to make sure that there is accountability in place. Accountability is a good thing. Sure. Um, one of the, <clears throat> the other areas related to, to kind of related to cash is um, the different styles of accounting methods. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, a, a lot of business owners will often 
kind of manage their business by their bank account, right? You yeah. look in and you see there's 20,000, 30,000, 5,000, whatever the number may be. And that's assessing the health of your company. And that's kind of like the cash, the cash based accounting method to some degree. Um, yeah. But then there's also accrual where you're getting uh, prepayments and um, you know, things are being uh, allocated in the different areas of your accounting system. So can you talk a little bit about which system works best for tour operators and how maybe just a little bit about conceptually how they're different because mm -hmm. they are just very different approaches to managing your books. Yeah, absolutely. One of the really common pitfalls is tour operators will get prepayments for tours and then spend the money before it's been earned. And so it's really important to make sure that they've got a deposit account set aside for the funds until it's time for that tour to come around. And now those funds aren't refundable. Otherwise, say a tour gets canceled and you've already spent the cash, that's a big problem. With cash versus accrual accounting, um, it, can be, it can be confusing at first to understand some of those ideas. And fortunately, the modern software programs like QuickBooks, you can toggle back and forth between cash and accrual with the click of a button and see your data in different ways. And most tour companies file their taxes on cash basis because they don't want to pay taxes on money that they haven't received yet. Um, but on the flip side of that, we need to be looking at the tours management accounting and making the decisions that the tour operators need to make on an accrual basis. So the difference between cash and accrual is like, do you count your chickens before they're hatched or do you count your chickens when they're hatched? On cash base accounting, you count your chickens, your money <laughs> on your reports based on when it changes hands when cash changes hands, when a check changes hands, or when that credit card is swiped. That is when you count your money as being earned or spent. And that's when it will populate on your reports. On accrual-based accounting, you count your chickens, you count your money based upon when it's owed. And it will populate your reports based upon your open invoices and open bills before they're paid. So one of the key tricks with, it, with tour accounting is when you're booking a tour for the future, you want to date your invoice for the date of the tour. And that way in your reports, you're seeing that money on a cruel basis, populating your reports as of the day the tour starts. And that is when we consider the money as earned because it's no longer refundable. Or even if you have a refund policy where it's no longer refundable 30 days before, you can still have that in mind, but you want to have it in your books with the invoice for the tour as of the date the tour starts. And that way it's irrelevant on a cruel basis. When the payments come in, you can be receiving pay prepayments from your customers um, and they will affect your accounts receivable, which is the account on your balance sheet that shows you how much money you are owed or prepaid by your customers. On the same note, the expenses for that tour, if you're prepaying for expenses, you also want to date those bills for when the tour starts. So if you are subcontracting a tour to a local travel company, then you want to date that company's bill for the day of the start of the tour. And that way the, the tours invoices and bills are coming in and populating within the same time period. Otherwise what you have is some expenses over here and some income over there, and you're not able to see it lining up within a time period. And it makes for really confusing reporting particularly since oftentimes with safari companies, for example, a lot of the income and expense is often happening even years in advance. And you don't want to have to pay taxes on a tour that's happening in 2019. Mm -hmm. It's not going to, it's not going to work. So that's a really important thing for tour companies to really look into is when are they dating their transactions for? And it varies dramatically by the needs of the different companies. A safari company's needs are going to be extremely different from someone who is running day tours that are often booked the previous day or day of. Right. So, so understanding your company's needs is a big piece. Yeah. And, and the net effect of that will be 
a more um, smooth P&L where there's not large fluctuations in income or expenses and exactly I'll, right. I'll kind of give you a more consistent view of, of what your income and expenses are per month, which is yeah. really nice to not have to deal with those spikes that you see in cash based. Absolutely right. I mean, really, the only money that you want in your operations bank account is the money that you are going to be using over the next weeks or months. So having funds set aside for your upcoming tours and transferring the money out of your, um, your deposits holding account when it's earned is a really good workflow that can help tour companies to manage their cash flow and not overspend. Great. So as a, as a final question, what, uh, as a, as maybe a new tour operator or someone that's really just going to start tackling this, what advice would you give as a foundation to make sure that you're prepped, you know, internally um, to start to start uh, managing your profitability well, or to start maybe talking to you or someone like you in the future? What what advice would you give a new tour operator that's maybe just starting out the business from a financial perspective? Yeah, um, there are some great DIY tools if you you know, aren't budgeting for hiring an accounting professional yet. Um, there's some great DIY tools such as, I mean, QuickBooks Online, they've got tiers in their subscription and anything is better than nothing. Start getting the routines down, start, start your systems and processes. So if you get started with QuickBooks Online Simple Start, it's better than nothing. And then when you're ready, you can upgrade to Essentials to get a few more tools. And when you're ready, you can upgrade to QuickBooks Online Plus, which is what has the class tracking. You don't necessarily have to start with all of the bells and whistles, but in the same way, you know, of the first step to really getting healthy is go for a walk. <laughs> it's, you're, you're not going to do it sitting in your easy chair watching Netflix eating ice cream. <laughs> yep. It's not going to happen. So you've got to start somewhere. So starting on the right footing, getting the systems and the habits set up, and that way you're monitoring things. And look online for some good education. You know, we've got some great educational tools on our website. And just start learning, increasing your awareness. And feel free to reach out to people. One great tool that can be a really fantastic DIY tool for startups. Um, we have Facebook group for tour company operators. Um, and it, anyone's welcome to join it if they want to start the discussion and get feedback and ideas from other operators. It's free to join and just be part of the discussion. And we are happy to point people in the right direction and give them bits of advice here and there. And um, we started that Facebook group because I was looking online for groups that we could join. And I was seeing that all of the groups out there for tour operators were just marketing to each other particularly on LinkedIn. Oh my gosh, the groups on LinkedIn, it was just marketing noise. No one was actually discussing business strategy. And I realized that there was a need. So we created a thing. So yeah, people can hop on Facebook and join our group for tour business strategy. And that's a really, really great place for startups to get the ball rolling. So how do they find, uh, how do they find you personally in your business? And then mm -hmm. how do they find your, uh, how do they find that Facebook group? What's it called? Um, it is called Cultural and Adventure Tour Leaders Business Strategy Group. Perfect. We'll add that to the, uh, to the description in the show notes as well. Yeah. So find you. And then to find me, they can really just go to our website is the easiest way. It's polymath.com, P-O-L-Y-M-A-T-H.com. And that has the information about um, us and our business. And if they're interested in becoming a new a client, they can fill out our new client questionnaire and um, give us the information that we need about their business to get the conversation rolling or um, check out our blog. We've got some blogs that are specific to the tour industry and educating on these topics that we've been talking about here today. And particularly that tool that they can download for the budgeting. That's a tool that we use with our clients and you can do it on your own. It might be nice to be able to get some insight from a professional, but if you're not there yet, that's okay. Give it a try. It's always worth a try. <laughs> Great. Well, Ingrid, thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, we really appreciate your insight. And um, if anybody needs some help on the financial side, be sure to reach out to Ingrid. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Adam. This was great fun. All right. Thank you.